Hello everyone, thank you for joining. So today is a, a new a new setup for the Etincelle, as you, as you noticed. So we are uh, streaming on uh, YouTube. So today is a, a new a new setup. Well, I got some weird echo. Could you hear that? Yeah, you should mute the, the YouTube channel probably. You're on. Okay, so I will ask you to to ask your questions on the YouTube chat, and I will relay them to the speaker um, at the end of the presentation. And so today, for today, uh, the speaker is well known to a large part of the audience. Is uh, uh, Stefan uh, Latner, who is a researcher at uh, Sony CSL. So Stefan studied in uh, Austria in Mint and uh, then joined um, Sony Paris, where he works in the music team to, to develop uh, um, artificial intelligence for music production and music understanding. And uh, so, yeah, thank you very much, Stefan, for accepting to, to give a presentation. So uh, the stage is yours. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, David. And um, I'm diving directly into it. Um, sharing my screen and okay. I hope you can see it. Um, just tell me if not. Okay, so uh, welcome to my presentation: neural audio synthesis and restoration with generative adversarial networks. The presentation is based on a few papers um, where the, the authors of the papers I've written down here, um, Javier Nistal, Joram, Aram Möhr and Gail Richard. And um, if I'm honest, I should actually put um, Javier Nistal in front because um, most of the work um, he has done in his uh, PhD studies um, under my supervision. So um, the outline of the presentation, I will give um, a short introduction into, into audio synthesis. And uh, then I will give some um, experimental um, 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 works we've done on um, audio synthesis. First, we, we, tried to, uh, we tried different audio representations um, to find um, those representations that work well for our model, for our generative model. And then I will present a few models, um, drum gun, dark gun, the QCPC gun, and also an adversarial musical, musical audio restoration framework. And then I will conclude and give some future directions. So um, a, a common audio synthesizer is basically a device that, that generates some sound based on a signal processing pipeline. So there are different models, sound generators, um, there is a pipeline with some filters and other modules. And uh, this pipeline can be controlled with um, parameters by a user. And um, in, in general, these parameters are quite um, low level and directly manipulate um, modules of this signal processing pipeline. And this can be quite complex, like looking at the common um, synthesizer. Um, we see there are loads of controls. Um, it's quite a technical approach to, to sound generation. And also such synthesizers are um, usually limited to specific, to basically the signal processing pipeline, the underlying signal processing pipeline. So you cannot suddenly generate a, a, a dog barking sound with such a synthesizer if it's not built for it. In contrast, uh, neural audio synthesis um, is more general. It can basically generate any sound as long as um, the, uh, the, neural, uh, the neural model was trained on data, um, including such sounds. So it's basically based on a, on a data set, um, possibly with some annotations. And then um, a generative neural network is trained on this data set. And uh, at test time, um, the user can then control this generative uh, neural network using basically the annotations um, that have been delivered with the data. For example, if we say, okay, that's now a bird sound or that's now a dog barking sound, we have then controls um, where we can control the birdiness or the dogginess of the actual output, which, um, which is actually quite an intuitive and high level uh, user control 
which is basically a, a game changer in terms of how we, we can generate audio. So that's uh, definitely an advantage. Um, we can basically train such a model on, on all different kinds of, of data and we have a better user control. <clears throat> At the same time, as it's common for neural networks, we don't really know how, how in detail um, it will work. So it, it, it lacks a bit of interpretability and it's generally also costly. It can take weeks to train such models. Um, you also need lots of data and it might be also costly um, at the, at the uh, user. Um, so it, it might not be real time if the user doesn't have a appropriate setup. So, and there are many different uh, generative neural networks, meanwhile, also have been applied to audio, like autoencoders, autoregressive uh, models, normalizing flows um, worked also quite well, but they're a bit limited to lower dimensional data. Nowadays, or a quite hot topic uh, currently are diffusion models. So they, they might take over um, for generating complex, um, um, complex data. And uh, the quasi standard in the last uh, three, four, maybe five years um, are generative adversarial networks for, for generating um, complex uh, data points, um, drawing um, samples from complex distributions. And that's why we used them um, also in our work. Um, yeah. <clears throat> so what, uh, what are generative adversarial networks? Sorry for those who who heard this already uh, many times. Generative adversarial networks consists of two models, a generator and a discriminator, and we have a data set. And um, we feed into the generator, we feed some random noise and possibly some conditioning, some additional information about the, the data. And then the generator um, tries to draw a sample from the data distribution. And we also take an actual um, so an actual data point from the data distribution. And then uh, we train the discriminator to discriminate between the actual data and the sample from the generator. Um, and uh, we basically actively train the discriminator to distinguish between, um, between the real data and the fake data. And then the generator is trained to fool the discriminator so that the discriminator can actually not discriminate between real and fake data. And if the generator succeeds in doing so, then it has basically succeeded to draw um, plausible um, models, convincing models from the data distribution. And scans have been already applied to, to audio before we started our work, for example, in WaveGAN, um, directly generating uh, waveforms. So these are examples of piano excerpts so it's audible that they are piano, but it's uh, the quality is not uh, very good yet. In Gansund, um they generated uh, um, static uh, tonal sounds of different synthesizers and so on, conditioned on uh, pitch. This was generated in the magnitude and instantaneous frequency um, um, domain. Yeah, so um, again, advantages of neural audio synthesizers are that um, we can control them with quite intuitive parameters as long as we provide this information at train time already or on some musical context. And uh, those models are universal, so they can basically train, uh, uh, learn the distribution of any um, data set and are therefore um, source agnostic and um, do, do not rely on a, on a predefined um, 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 signal processing pipeline. So as a summary, the, the concept would be we have our GAN synthesizer conditioned on musical context or on some um, user um, controls. Then of course they synthesize some sound and the user can then um, change the user controls in order to manipulate the sound <clears throat> until um, they arrive at the sound um, they desired. <clears throat> so again, the contributions are, um, um, we, we compared some audio representations for generation with GANs, and then um, we, uh, we 
published a few papers, one on drum gun, dark gun, BQCPC gun, and MP3 restoration using guns. And for the most of the models, we used a progressive growing gun um, paradigm, which is um, guns are generally not easy to train. And um, so in the progressive growing um, gun paradigm, we basically start with a very small model and we try to generate a very low resolution data. So subsample data, very small um, data points, uh, low dimensional. And then we slowly grow the model um, in, in size and also we grow the resolution of our data um, until we obtain actually our, our real and high, high resolution <clears throat> data and have a big model. And this has turned out to work um, quite well and that's why we used it. <clears throat> so let's um, show some experiments. So first um, we compared some representations for audio synthesis with scans. So um, why is this a topic? Well, um, for classification tasks, it was actually, it's, it's not that important which, um, which representation one uses as long as the classifier is, is strong enough. So it was um, MEL spectrograms were used, MEL capstroms, log magnitude spectrums and so on. But um, for, for generation, we have some um, additional challenges. So um, the, the representation we use um, depends a lot on the, on the model architecture, um, if it's a sequential model, then maybe we use rather some waveforms or um, if it's convolutional, we would like to have maybe 2D um, um, representations. And also on the, on the data itself, so um, percussive data might need different representations than tonal um, audio data. And also, and that's the most important thing, is that we actually, in the end, want um, some waveforms again. So whatever representation um, we choose, we in, in the end want to invert this representation to go back to actual waveforms because of course we want to listen to it in the end. So raw audio signal is a quite obvious representation, but then um, um, a very common representation is also to, to transform this raw audio signal into spectral components to obtain magnitude and, and phase spectrums. But the phase is usually quite um, noisy, so there are also other tricks like magnitude and instantaneous frequency, which make the phase a bit less noisy. Um, and then there are other representations which basically deal often with um, um, in introducing higher resolution in the lower frequencies where we actually have a higher resolution also in our ears than in any standard um, um, spectrogram representation. But for, for these representations, we often have the, prob uh, the problem of invertibility. So what we did is we set up an experiment um, using the ENSYN data set. These are 20, 22,000 different tonal instrument sounds um, with pitch annotations. <laughs> such um, sounds like this. And uh, then we transform these sounds in different representations, waveform, complex, magnitude, instantaneous frequency, CQ, and so on. So we, we used uh, different representations and trained the model, um, trained different models on all these different representations. And uh, in the end, we realized, and um, you don't need to look at the numbers here, um, but what I wanted to say is basically we realized that uh, the complex representation to use actually the complex components of a short term Fourier transform directly led to um, surprisingly good results. Um, and it's interesting because um, there, there is not that much prior work that used these representations. And magnitude and instantaneous frequency also works um, quite well, particularly for tonal um, sounds. Um, for percussive sounds, it's a bit um, uh, problematic because um, mag magnitude and instantaneous frequency might not be able to preserve some some steep um, transients in the in the waveform. Um, so, but yeah, let's listen to some samples from the complex representation. <laughs> So even though there might be some ringing in the higher frequencies, um, it actually provides us with quite a crisp sound. While waveform gives us quite a noisy um, sound and also male spectrogram didn't work so well for us. 
Yeah. So um, therefore, we go with complex and uh, magnitude instantaneous frequency in our future um, experiments, particularly using complex components um, for percussive sounds, which we did in our um, first uh, paper, Drum Gun, where we um, aimed at um, synthesizing drum sounds with um, with a generative adversarial network. So we used uh, 300,000 percussive um, sounds, um, short samples of, of, of percussion um, instruments. And uh, yeah, it sounded like this. Okay, and we have the instrument annotations available if it's kick, snare or cymbal sounds. And then we also extracted some features from, from these sounds using a, a feature extractor. And uh, we used that uh, to condition the generator on it so that um, a user can afterwards control perceptual features um, um, of this generator or of the generated sounds. And as I said before, we used uh, complex SDFT components as an uh, audio representation here. So, um, and <clears throat> the, the results are actually quite good. We have no audible artifacts. We have quite a good coverage of the data um, set. And uh, yeah, and we took these samples then and created some loops so that, um, uh, that they become a bit more musical. Okay, so actually it's a proper sound. Um, one can directly use this for, for music production. It's actually 44 um, kilohertz sample rate. And um, yeah, this is now, um, we created a prototype out of this model, um, which is a VST, um, where we uh, basically dropped the, the perceptual feature conditionings, but we kept um, the class controls. So kick, snare, and cymbal sound, and this can be still controlled. And after training the, the, the GAN, we actually trained also an in, in, in inverse model to, to be able to encode existing samples into the latent space of the, of the GAN in order to create some variations of it. So that's actually very interesting. Um, for example, we, we took a, a beatboxing audio um, of um, CJ Carr from Databots. He gave this to me as a, uh, to try. And then we can encode the, the beatboxing and we can decode it again um, in order to obtain actual uh, drum set sounds from that. Um, yeah, let's listen to it. It's called music. I teach it to your kids when they're four. It's called music. Yeah, and this is now the original mixed with the decoded uh, um, sounds. It's called music. But did you do your kids when they're four? It's called music. But did you do your kids when they're four? It's called music. Yeah, I think you got the idea. It's it's really fun. We are now about to uh, to create a an own plugin just for for beatboxing. Yeah, I give you a quick um, <clears throat> quick demo of the, of the drum gun uh, interface. So basically, what we see here is a two dimensional uh, plane in the hundred twenty eight dimensional latent space of the gun, where we can. Um, click around and basically explore this latent space. We can always change the rotation of the plane so we get another random plane um, through the latent space. And we can also um, position the point randomly in the latent space by clicking auto trip. <coughs> And what's important is that we have here now these um, conditional features, so we can basically control the kickness, snareness, and simpleness of the sound. So we can increase the kickness. Um, 
or reduce this nearness, of course. Or more simple. And so on. So yeah, that's uh, the basic idea. And what we also can do is we can um, we can drop in um, an existing sample. So for example, such a kick sound. Um, or well, let's say it is right. It's very silent. Okay, and once we have this, um, um, we produce this sound, we can then again search in the neighborhood in order to create variations of it. Yeah. So that's the idea of this uh, drum gun VST plugin. And the interesting side note, the, the, the whole plugin or the whole um, standalone in this case has 350 megabyte. And it was trained on 500 gigabyte of training data. So um, even though it might not be able to reconstruct all of this data perfectly, um, it's still um, obvious that this is quite some compression when using such a neurosynthesizer as opposed to using a, a whole library of, of samples. And it was, it's basically used a, a lot already by different artists and also an artist called 29 um, released a sample pack based um, or generated with only um, our drum synthesizers. Um, which is uh, commercially available. It's the AI drum kit. Yeah. Okay, let's go to the second paper, Dark Gun, um, Knowledge Distillation in Audio Generation. So we started with the, with the research question, um, is it possible to basically distill the knowledge of a pre-trained classifier into a generative neural network um, while not having the data available the classifier was trained on actually? So, and the model is called Dark Gun, um, simply because we are, we are um, using this concept of dark knowledge, which was mentioned by Hinton um, in 2014. So, um, what is dark knowledge? Well, if you usually train a classifier on, on for example, to, to classify such handwritten digits, you basically tell, tell the classifier for every, for every digit which class it is on, and you give you give it hard labels. So you say, this is a one, this is a five, this is a four and so on. And it's only a one. But if you then let such a classifier predict given such data, um, it might be that you don't get this, um, this hard label. So usually you get um, a bit of a softer distribution because as we see this one could also be a seven somehow. So you get some probability mass assigned to the class seven or instead of five, it could be also a three this is very similar to a three, so you also the, 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 the classifier might also give you um, some probability weight for three and so on. This four could also be a bit of a nine <clears throat> and so on. So, and the idea is now, if you would use such soft labels instead of hard labels to train another classifier, um, then it is possible to basically omit um, full, uh, full classes from the training set and still the classifier can then still um, um, classify such omitted classes from the um, from the train set uh, from from the test set. So, for example, um, if we never show a three to a classifier, but um, we still show a five, which has some similarity to a three, and we tell it that there is it's a bit three-like, or we never show um, a nine, but we show fours, which look a bit like nines. Um, then, still in the end, such a classifier can um, can classify properly such uh, nines. And this is what Hinton figured out. And this is also what we facilitate um, as um, in order to distill the knowledge. And yeah, and this is kind of dark knowledge because it's kind of hidden in so a five, which looks a bit like a three has some dark knowledge about the three inside. So again, our problem was, okay, how can we distill um, the knowledge of a pre-trained classifier into a generative neural network? And what we did is we used some data. We classify this data using this pre-trained classifier and we obtain soft labels. 
And note again, this data is quite different to the actual data the classifier was trained on. And then using these soft labels, we condition a generative neural network. Um, and then we, we hope that if we then overemphasize some of the categories, that we can basically um, distill such sounds from our data, um, which the classifier was trained on. So more specifically, we have um, we again use our ancient data set. We know this already. And then we use a classifier, pre-trained classifier, trained on actual YouTube videos on um, the audio set ontology, which includes classes like sonar, kick drum, bird, bell, engine, and so on. And uh, note again, for example, we have no kick drum or any percussive sounds in our actual data set. But still, there might be some sounds that have some percussive um, characteristics in there. And uh, we use this um, dark knowledge in there to basically then extract um, what a kick drum could be. And then we condition on the, on the dark gun. And um, at test time, we then have uh, an, init an initial sample. <laughs> And then we just overemphasize some of the conditioning features, for example, sonar. And we get a sound sounding closer to sonar or kick drum. As I said, we don't have any percussive sounds in there, but it's uh, quite some approximation. So it sounds much more percussive and um, has low frequencies. <clears throat> or the mantra label is also very nice. Yeah, and uh, this is now possible for, for many different classes. All of them actually were not contained in the initial, in the data the model was trained on. So that's the initial one. And then we can say we want to sound, let it sound more like a theremin. <clears throat> or like a violin. Or like a siren. A tuning fork. And so on. I think you got you got the idea. So that's actually really nice because now we have some some controls um, which are very semantic, and we can shape our sound accordingly. Yeah, the next paper is uh, VQCPC gun. Um, so the basic uh, problem is that um, usually in generative um, neural networks, especially in GANs, um, you have always fixed size output. Or also, if you generate audio, you have a fixed length um, output, audio output. And we've um, asked the question, uh, can we um, basically uh, generate a variable length audios with GANs? And uh, what we did <coughs> is um, we, we, um, we learned some discrete features from, from audio frames. Um, discrete features using vector vector quantized contrastive predictive coding. Um, so the, the idea is that we have dynamic features that change over time. Um, and they, in our case, we trained them so that they are invariant to pitch and invariant to timbre. So they actually only represent the, the envelope of the sound. And then uh, we also have some fixed um, fixed static features which are which remain um, constant over time, which is some noise and uh, the pitch um, information. And the noise basically captures everything that the pitch and the envelope doesn't capture, so it's basically the timbre. timbre. <laughs> yeah, and uh, then we have a fully convolutional uh, generator. So at every time step, the generator obtains a different dynamic feature label, which describes the envelope and always fixed um, pitch and, and noise labels. And uh, as a proof of concept, um, we, we basically can now upsample the VQCPC features, so we just repeat some of these numbers in order to stretch the sound. Um, so in that case, we have uh, the original five second uh, versions. <laughs> Yeah, and then we can stretch it to one second. Or to two seconds. Yeah, and I think it's promising for also more complex audio data. Um, 
we, we, we always have this uh, fixed noise which which um, imposes some coherence over time and then we have some some dynamically changing features this could also be more interpretable like uh, loudness or actually pitch um, contours or zero trajectories um, and um, and with this we um, yeah um, I, I I'm quite um, optimistic that um, the, such an architecture could be used also for non-auto regressive um, audio generation. Yeah, and the last paper I want to talk about is um, um, restoration of heavily compressed musical audio um, using generative artificial networks, published in um, the MDPI electronics channel. And uh, here the, the, the question was, can we actually um, restore heavily compressed um, audios um, where it's not clear anymore, um, or there is no single unique best solution how to restore those um, audios. So actually we need a stochastic model for it in order to create plausible restorations. Um, this could be useful at one point for, for streaming, um, to reduce the bandwidth of streaming or for storing data. If it's not that important that you have the actual um, original audio, um, but you have a plausible version of the audio um, where it does not actually matter that it's the actual original audio, then um, such a model could be useful. And uh, yeah, and and it's again very similar to the to standard um, GAN architecture. We input as a conditioning, we input MP3 audio, and we input some noise to the generator. We ask the generator to give us a restored version, and the discriminator sees original and sees the the restored um, versions and should not and should be trained to to distinguish between them and also we feed the actual mp3 input also to the discriminator it makes um, its job a bit easier and here you can see some some restorations we have the original um, excerpt and we have an mp3 um, highly compressed uh, mp3 file so you see the all the high frequency content is missing here and then we have different uh, restorations that all, that all um, look different and have added some different um, um, high frequency um, um, content again. And uh, we can of course listen to this as well. So here we have an original file. And a compressed version. And a restored version. So I hope you can hear this through the internet, uh, but yeah, I will just go on with the second example anyhow. And I mean it from the bar. So this is now heavily compressed. And I mean it from the bar. Losing all the high frequency con content and then a restored version of it. And I mean it from the bar. So one can hear um, the, 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 percuss the percussion sounds, the cymbal sounds and snare and so on um, has um, their high frequency spec. Okay, so let me conclude. Um, we showed that um, we found out that um, magnitude and instantaneous frequency as well as complex SDFT components are nice representations for generation with GANs, audio generation with GANs. And it's actually an interesting finding that the actual complex SDFT components are working well because they are not widely used for generation. And this is now kind of a, um, also a suggestion to use them particularly for, for percussive um, data. And uh, yeah, then we showed that in drum gun, um, we can generate convincing uh, drum samples, which are already used by several artists and there are sample packs available. Um, dark gun, we actually um, succeeded in, in transferring or distilling some knowledge from a predefined, uh, pre trained classifier into a generator. The cube CPC gun um, is promising for, for um, generating longer audio, also more complex audio than we showed. And uh, we also um, could restore the threes using cards. Um, so we obtained a considerable improvement compared to the original MP3s or to, to the compressed versions. In the future, we would like to extend drum gun to loop generation, um, or at least to, to make a, a big step and into a, a polyphonic or multi-instruments at the same time to generate them. 
Um, we also need to put some research into how to control the latent space exploration better, because as you saw, we basically randomly jump around in the latent space and um, use random planes, um, and it's not uh, very controllable. Um, then uh, also using others, um, using it on other sound sources like natural sounds, maybe also singing voice. Um, then explore other ways of conditioning the model. Um, there are um, promising um, experiments, for example, using PCA components for conditioning, which um, yeah separates the the space or the variability quite nicely actually of the of the data distribution. Then um, we could use uh, the QCPC GAN um, for music performance synthesis or for longer sequences, as I said before. Question of reducing model sizes is still out there, or maybe there is something like distillation. Maybe that's a thing also for generative models. And then uh, we will look into diffusion models. So all the above does not um, is not necessarily meant to be used with generative adversarial networks. So our diffusion models are currently, as I said, a hot topic. Um, we will definitely go in this direction as well. And maybe there are other models coming up in the future and probably and most likely. And then we will jump on those. OK, thank you very much for your attention. And here are the things I was um, describing today. And um, you can Google my name or Javier's name, so you will find code, um, additional material, examples, and so on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stefan. Um, so again, for, for those who want to to ask questions, please put it in the chat, in the YouTube chat, and I will relay them to, to Stefan. Um, so, yeah, it, uh, very nice uh, demonstration you showed, like with drum, drum gun. It's really exciting to see uh, something really uh, 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 used in production and etc. Just, uh, I remember, maybe you remember Stefan, who was in the lab uh, some time ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I I worked with him when he was uh, uh, working with GAN, so I didn't train GAN myself. But uh, I know one of the difficulties in training GAN is you have some uh, mod collapse effect sometimes. And, uh, and um, yes, well, well, I guess the, there are some tricks on how to avoid that. And could, could you comment on that? Yeah. Um, so there are first there are tricks, um, and then um, the, the general training of guns has been improved also um, throughout the years. So one thing, for example, the progressive growing um, um, already helps here, but uh, a very um, very targeted trick um, to to avoid the mode collapse, um, for example, is in the discriminator to enforce a specific distribution the discriminator has in its latent um, activations, um, which is similar to the distribution um, it um, when you show it actual real data. So if you show it some real data, you transform um, you project this into some um, intermediate layers of the discriminator. You will get some um, variants in the in the in the different dimensions, and you can take this variance and impose a regularization um, to also obtain such a variance when you show generated examples. And that's, for example, a very targeted um, regularization to avoid uh, mode collapse. But as I said, also progressive growing is is one way, and also. The new uh, Wasserstein guns, they also do not suffer so much from, from wood collapse than, for example, the, the Sigmoid um, Zero One guns we had in the very beginning and so on. So there was, there was quite some progress um, over time. Okay. Other tricks involved. <coughs> okay, thank you very much. Uh, there was a question, but it's already replied is uh, how can we try the VST? So I guess uh, uh, Jordi, you would have to wait for. Of that uh, a bit because it's yeah, used in. I'm quite optimistic it wouldn't take that long anymore. That some something, but uh, yeah, we don't have a fixed time plan for this. Yes, then there is a, another question by Andrew. Uh, how close are we to getting some of this model to run in real time on contiguous small buffers? 
yeah well um it's a bit of the question also how much hardware support we will <coughs> get in the future <coughs> Um, so in, on, on Max, uh, there, there are already some libraries available um, that can access the, the GPUs, um, which are not uh, NVIDIA um, GPUs. So um, I, I hope um, we will, we will um, get closer to, to real time um, with, with that. Um, basically, we, we really need to, like, as I said, if we can reduce the model sizes at one point, um, but um, yeah, we, we have already quite small models for, as I said, 350 megabyte, um, where 500 gigabyte are somehow compressed in there. I don't know if we can reduce the model sizes a lot, so we really have to wait for for um, better um, hardware access, uh, I guess. And, yeah, yeah I, I don't know, maybe the, if you think about the variable length um, GANs, maybe we can really go for um, frame wise at one point, and then we, we can also facilitate buffers better and not generate everything at once, but generate like um, frame wise. Could also help. Oh. Even though you, um, the, the drum GAN, it took, um, let's say, below, uh, lower than a second yeah. to generate a sample on the CPU only. So actually, we are not that far away from, from having a real-time output. And um, I was wondering, for example, for the audio restoration, um, um, how big is the matrix, the, uh, are the matrix? Uh, um, like, how long, do, how long audio do you take, and how big is the matrix? Um, a matrix, I don't know what you mean with matrix, but... I like the spectrogram, the complex uh, spectrogram. Um, well, um, I take four seconds of audio um, with a window size of, of 2048, I guess. Okay, so you get in Windows uh, the signal? Pardon? So you, you get the signal in Windows? I know. Um, I, I meant uh, window size for the um, short-term Fourier transform. Okay. So we have a, a height of 2048, and uh, we basically have uh, four seconds. So I think we have around 800 frames or something. So it's it's already quite big. But I use um, a fully convolutional um, generator here as well. So. Um, yeah, we don't need to compress everything into one. So we, we have some sliding window also in terms of uh, in the generator. Okay. And there is then a question by Jeremy. Um, and also, you, maybe you don't see the chat, but you've got many people thanking you for, for, for the presentation. But so Jeremy asked, how did you evaluate the quality of the restaurant audio with a train gun? Well, um, we, we did different um, like quantitative evaluations as well as uh, user studies. Um, best is really you go into the um, uh, paper yourself. You can also evaluate it yourself um, in the, at the accompaniment website. There are lots of um, examples. But um, yeah, um, we, we use different metrics like um, standard MSC between the um, between the, 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 the spectrograms, uh, we use signal to noise ratio, we need the uh, frigid audio distance, uh, lots of standard metrics also we used for the other generative models. Um, but yeah, look into the paper, there are quantitative evaluations, but also we did some user studies. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so if there are no more questions coming on the chat, I think we can close it here. Okay.